and the Holy Spirit has drawn, drawn you to this place, this zip code. And I believe that the Lord has a word for you that is going to revolutionize your life. So that 2017 looks nothing like 2016. I'm believing that the Lord will give you such a word that when you walk out of here, you will never ex accept mediocrity another day in your life. You will never accept poverty. You will never accept struggle another day in your life in Jesus name. Our Father and our God will give you praise and honor and glory. You assign this place and you have assigned these people. And as I stand, I decrease so that you may increase. I pray for a special anointing that the anointing will break yokes that you would think through my mind, that you would speak through my lips, that there be none of me and all of you. Bless our time together. Give us an accurate word. Let there be a demand that is being made in the realm of the spirit. Let everyone that comes walk out of here differently. Empower us, Father, to walk out our destiny and give us insight, give us strategy. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And in advance, we give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you make a declaration to the person on your left and right? Can you announce to them that this is the last day you're going to see me in this state? This is the last day you're going to see me in this state. Tomorrow about this time, everything about me is going to be different. My mind is going to be better. My marriage is going to be better. My money is going to be better. Everything about me is going to change for the best. If you believe it, can you lift your voice and give God some praise in advance? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can you lift up your voice? Can you take your praise to another level? Can we just acknowledge the presence of God, the power of God, the spirit of God? He is here. He is here. Angels are here as ministers. Hallelujah. To carry the anointing to you. You will not leave here like you came. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Please be seated. We won't be before you long. I realize that uh, and, and we, we, we have a different kind of uh, church member now. Uh, we put God on a schedule. And if God doesn't move within that time frame, then he just has to come back the next day. Because most of us have to go home. We've got to rest up to be pimped by Babylon. We're going, we, we rest up for Babylon, but we're not going to rest, rest up for God. We usually give God our leftover, and it's a sad commentary. When we convince others to follow God, but we ourselves are not following God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. But I decree and declare whatever residue from the world is still in your life is going to be driven out by the anointing. I'm decreeing that. I'm decreeing that you're going to get your joy back, your peace back, your praise back, your power back. I'm decreeing and declaring that you're going to get your passion back for the things of the Lord. A passion for prayer, a passion for worship, a passion for the word of God. You are going to get your passion back. You're going to get your power back. You're going to get your anointing back. Amen. I realize that so many people have been through so much and are still going through. But the supernatural is the thing that's going to sustain you. Many people are trying to do it outside of God. And the results, unfortunately, are less than stellar. But anything that you do inside of God, I decree and declare, hallelujah, that God will not disappoint you. You're going to get your harvest. Whatever seed you have planted yesterday, the harvest is going to come tomorrow. Amen. And it's not going to be long yet, long from now that God is going to bless you. How many of you came here because you wanted something from God? You needed a word from God. You know, I, I, I travel from uh, church to church and ministry to ministry and denomination to denomination and country to country. And one of the things that I've noted 
about the body of Christ, where the anointing used to be weighty. Now the anointing, the, the, the registry of the anointing, is, it, it's almost like it's on empty. And people are coming to church and they're not expecting anything from God. We, we have Christians that are non-believers. They, they, they're Christian, yes. You can fight them, but they don't believe God for anything. Amen? But I want to know, is there a believer still in the house? Is there anybody that still says, I believe God. I believe in the word of God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that God is still able. He still moves. He still heals. He still delivers. He still saves. Is there anybody in here that is a believer tonight? Believers have a way of making a demand off of the anointing. Amen. They're not making a demand off of the person, but they're making the demand off of the anointing. Wherever there's a demand, there will be a supply. If there's no demand, there's no supply. And I decree tonight that you're going to make a demand off of the anointing. That you're, gonna, you're not going to allow me to walk out of here with one iota of revelation that belongs in, in this place. You're not going to let me walk out with an anointing that belongs here. You're going, to, you're going to make a demand off of it. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Tell that person to your left and right. Let them know. Look at me. And within the next hour, everything about me will be changed for the best. Everything. Every, I decree it. Yes, yes. You may take your seat. It's great to be here with my friend, Apostle Tuggerson. And Apostle Tuggerson, one thing that I've recognized about ministry is this. That they can either make a demand off of your personhood or off of your anointing. And as long as you see us as just persons, you will miss what we are carrying in our personhood. Are you with me? And so we've got to, we've got to be able to see beyond the flesh and to be able to discern what God is doing. And this is not just for me. This is for you, too. The person on your left and right ought to discern who's sitting beside them. And so the time is far spent, is too far spent for us to, to still be in a place in the church where we are expecting a person to do something. We should be expecting God to do something. If God can use a donkey, he can use anybody. Amen. Let's go to the word of God. Again, uh, Apostle, thank you for being here. And Pastor Targerson, thank you so much to you and your wife for the work that you were doing here. We miss your sister and let her know that we miss her presence as well. And your granddaughter. We miss them both. Amen. I asked about her uh, when I came. Let her know that I send my love and my prayers, my warmest regards for an exciting and exceptional, a prosperous and blessed year to her and her family in Jesus' name. Let's go to the book of Ruth. It's a familiar text, and we want to pull a revelation from out of the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth. Amen. Look at verse number 16. And I'll be reading um, from verse 16 of chapter 1 to Ruth, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And let's see if we can bring some of the text together. The Bible said, and Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou dieth will I die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded, when she had made a decision, this was her intention to go, her intention to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? Here's the thing. It's possible for the world to be moving on and you to be stuck. And I decree and declare that you will not have a repeat of last year. I decree that there is a reset in your life, in your family. 
finances, that everything that was old, I pronounce a benediction upon it. I decree that this is a new year, and this is going to be a new year with new opportunities. I decree that the old season is over, it's severed. The Bible said to everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. When we walked out of 2016, on the 31st of January, there was a pronouncement of a benediction on that year. It was called an old year for, some, for a reason. This is a new year. And new means new. And I decree and declare that you will not only have new opportunities, you will have a new mindset. That you will not go into this year with the old strategies. Do the same, get the same. Do different, get different. I decree an upgrading of your strategy. And that the, the relationships that brought you here, you will have enough courage to be able to assess whether those relationships have the capacity to take you to the next level. And if they don't have the capacity, there are some relationships that you are going to have to pronounce the benediction on. And these are not just relationships with people. This is relationships with a mindset, a relationship with a strategy, a relationship with a season, how you relate to money, how you relate to God. I decree that there is a reason reset button that has been hit in your life and God is resetting everything concerning your life. It means that you have the opportunity to do something new. You can build a new marriage. You can build a new business. You can build a new ministry. All things have passed away. God is doing a new thing. Not an old thing that he's renewing. He's doing a new thing in Jesus' name. The Bible said that the whole city moved about them. And they said, is that Naomi? And she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt with me bitterly. And the word Mara means bitterly bitterness the lord has dealt with me bitterly i went out full and the lord had brought me home again empty why then call me naomi and the word Naomi comes from a Hebrew word which means my delight, my delight. And seeing the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem, Bethlehem. They came to the house of bread in the beginning of the barley Har harvest uh, Ruth 2 1 and then Naomi had a kinsman of her husband a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech and his name was Boaz interesting very interesting tonight uh I started uh last week uh, meditating on destiny what is destiny and uh, it's a word that so many people use, but we're still not clear what it means when we say destiny. When I hear people use the word destiny, uh, they're using, usually using it synonymous with purpose. Um, but destiny and purpose is two different things. Uh, the scripture says this. I call to heaven and earth, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 to 20. I call to heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. In other words, I've given you options. I've given you an option of life and I've given you an option of death. I've given you the option of blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose a life that both thy and thy seed may live. Now, this is a very important scripture because God is simply saying that destiny has to do with choice. In other words, the decisions that you make today determines where you are going tomorrow. And so tonight, very, very uh, succinctly, I want to preach on the topic, you have a date with destiny. You have a date with destiny. 
In our text, we are reading the story of Ruth the Moabite. Everybody knows about Ruth. Uh, It's interesting because she is amongst a very interesting uh, culture. She's living in an interesting culture. The culture is dictated to and finds its roots in perversion. We understand that the Moabites came from Moab, (coughs) who happened to be a uh, son of, Uh, of um, Lot, who was birthed in a incestual relationship. It's interesting because Abraham had prayed long before the relationship had happened. And years later, we still see the effects of Abraham's prayer and that he prayed that God would deliver his family from Sodom and Gomorrah or the stronghold of a culture. And that prayer reverberates. You understand that your prayers that you pray today, they don't disappear and dissipate. Because your prayers that you are making, especially those that you are praying out loud and the declarations that you are making, they don't disappear and dissipate. They loom in the atmosphere and environment waiting for the most uh, opportune time to uh, manifest itself. And so the prayers of Abraham were still in effect generations later because we see even as God delivered Lot and his family from out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the city burns, we see the same deliverance process with with, uh, Ruth, the Moabite. Uh, She would then be considered a seed of Abraham, albeit uh, the, the Moabites being birthed out of perversion or incestual relationship that the daughters have with the father. Let me share this with you. Uh, The dossier of Jesus Christ is a dossier that's mixed with people that have a riddled past. Uh, There were some who were incestual uh, individuals that were birthed out of incest. There were others that were prostitutes. And they all made it in the dossier of Jesus Christ, a testimony that you see in the book of Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, it goes through his dossier, and we discovered that purpose cannot be destroyed by circumstances. And purpose has a way of pushing its, itself through uh, the most uh, questionable histories to alter our destiny. And purpose is why you were born, which is different than destiny. And we're going to excavate it a little further. Uh, why were you born anyway? Uh, It's got to be more to life than you just growing up and getting a job and uh, uh, and then dying. Uh, There's got to be more to life than uh, you struggling all of your life. And your purpose gives you your why, your why. But destiny is different than purpose. Purpose is your why, but destiny is your where. Where do you end up? 10 years from now, 15 years from now, how is it that some people with less talent than you end up at the top and you are more educated and talented and you're still struggling? How is it that that this happens and it's almost as if it's a setup, but not so because I've discovered that your destiny is determined by decisions. In Deuteronomy 30, again, God gives you options. He said, here's your options. You can choose life, or you could choose death. You could choose blessing, or you can choose cursing. And then there's a call, and he said, if I were you, I would choose life. And not only for myself, but for future generations. It's a decision that we make. When we look at life, life is such a mystery to so many people. But John 10, 10 states, Jesus promising us that he would give us life and give it more abundantly. How many believers do you know personally living beneath the standard of living that God has designed and promised for them? In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Bible says, if you keep my commandment, 
He said, I, and walk before me. And it's a decision that you make. And to fear me, the Lord your God that bringeth you into a good land. In other words, God is going to give you the ability to live in the best neighborhood within your community. This is a scripture that God is promising. He said, for the Lord bringeth thee into a good land. The word bringeth, E-T-H, is a present active continuum. In other words, if, the, if, if, if you're in a zip code that once was the best neighborhood and that neighborhood runs down God has a better neighborhood for you you don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to live where you are. Once you figure out that I've got options. The Bible says I'm the Lord that bringeth you into a good land. A land of brooks, of waters, of fountains, and depths that spring out of the valley and the hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig tree and pomegranates. A land of oil and honey. In other words, I'm bringing you into a region where the economy is going to be floated by the goods within that particular region. In other words, you're going to live not only in a good neighborhood, but the economy within that region is going to be able to support your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is going to change this year. I am prophesying it. I'm prophesying it over you. I'm prophesying it over your ministry. I'm prophesying it over your family. This is the absolute poorest you will ever be. Every month there's going to be an option for you to change your financial and your economic status. And I'm commanding your eyes to be open. I decree that you will not be blinded or distracted by what is or is not going on in the natural economy. God has an economy that cannot be altered by man. The Bible said my God is able to supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. The more glory you have, the richer you become. You see, if the enemy can fight the glory, then he can fight your financial and economic breakthrough. I decree that this month is going to be a glorious month. I decree every month thereafter, you are going to be filled with his glory. I decree you're going to worship in his glory. You're going to live in his glory. You're going to pray in his glory. You're going to praise in his glory. You're going to sleep in his glory. You're going to work in his glory. I decree and declare a glorious season is here. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. I decree that the registry of God's glory is increased upon your life. Glory to God. The Bible says it's a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. In other words, you're going to live in the realm of abundance. I decree your days of lack are over. I decree you have more than enough. You have more than enough to live in a debt-free house, a mortgage-free house. I decree you have more than enough. Whatever you buy on credit this month, by the end of the month, your credit card will be paid. I decree you will not have to carry over any credit for the next month. Every one of us understand what it feels like to have more month than money. But your days of having more month than money are over. I decree that you are going from scarcity to abundance. You have more money than month. If you believe it, shout, I have more money than month. I decree, I'm decreeing something. I decree that any bill that comes to your house will be paid immediately. I decree you no longer have to wait for payday. I decree you have an abundance. You have a reservoir. You have a reserve. Glory to God. Let me just work this for a little while. Amen. <clears throat> 
I'm going to take you into a land where you shall eat bread without scarceness, that thou shalt lack any, not lack anything. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou may dig brass. Can I just prophesy? I decree that God is going to give you wisdom when you buy property. Somebody in here is going to buy a piece of property and you're going to discover oil on your property. I decree someone will give you property and they'll discover diamonds there. I decree diamond mines are coming. Oil wells are coming. I decree that people will live on rocks, but you will live on the top of wealth. I decree your neighborhood will be wealthy. I decree rocks, hallelujah, are going to be exchanged for iron. I decree brass is going to replace hallelujah. Hallelujah, stone. I decree that your season of living with lack is over. Verse number 10. When thou hast eaten and are full, watch this. When thou art eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping. I'm still in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Not keeping his commandments and his judgment and his statute, which I commend thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full. That's a promise. That's a promise. The Bible said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Your days of running on empty is over. So many people, there's nobody speaking into your life. And you're overdrawn emotionally. You're overspent mentally. You're over, you know, drawn spiritually. And there's nobody speaking into your life. You wake up exhausted. You go to bed exhausted. You don't know who to turn to anymore. But those days are over. God is going to fill you with so much joy. He's going to fill you with so much peace. He's going to fill you with so much direction. In fact, your days of confusion is over. You're going to know what to do every day of the week. Yes. The Bible says, just don't forget me and, and keep my commandments and my judgment and my statutes. And he says, lest when thou, thou art less, uh, uh, when thou has eaten and are full. So that's a promise. You're going to live f with fullness and has built goodly houses. Listen to me. You have built houses. Your days of renting houses are over. Your days of leasing houses are over. Your days of living in a house that someone else built is over. He said, lest th thou hast built goodly houses. Watch this. And dwell therein. Now this is important. Because there are so many people that rent houses that they can't live in. Why? Because they can't afford the mortgage. So they've got to lease it out. God is saying that you are going to build houses. That's plural. In other words, you're going to live in a mansion, but you're going to have vacation homes in other places. And you are not going to have to lease it out to pay the mortgage. Why? Because you're not going to need the money. So you're not going to live in scarcity. You're going to have abundance. In other words, you're going to live in your main house. Then you're going to have a vacation home in uh, uh, California. You're going to have a vacation home in London. You're going to have a vacation home in Paris. You're going to have a brownstone in New York City. And you're going to be able to travel to these houses. You and you alone are going to live in this house. And the houses are going to be well kept. That means you're going to have to have housekeepers in every state. 
You're not going to run out of money. Why? You're not even going to have to lease it out to pay anything because you're going to have more than e enough money for its upkeep. You are not going to live in a rundown mansion. Neither are you going to have run rundown vacation homes. God said, if you can just remember me, you're going to be able to build your own ho houses. I decree God is bringing into your life architects. I call in the new architects. I call them in from the north, the south, the east, and west. Begin to dream about the house you're going to live in. In fact, I prophesy you are going to live in your dream home. You are going to drive your dream car. You are going to go on your dream vacation and you're not going to have to run up your credit card to do it. You are going to pay cash. I'm getting ready to take you somewhere. The Bible says, and you dwell therein. You live in these houses. And then the Bible said, and when your herds and your flocks multiply. Well, we don't have herds, we don't have flocks, but we do have cars and airplanes. So your herds and your flocks, your herds and flocks, they either fed you or clothed you or you used them for transportation. Mm. Get ready to expand, expand your closet. You are going to wear the best. You're going to live in the best. And the Bible said when your herds and your flocks multiply, not add, but multiply. That means if you have 10 today, you have 20 tomorrow. If you have 20 tomorrow, you have 40 the next day. If you have 40, you, it's going to multiply and you're going to live exp exponentially. And your silver and your gold is multiplied. Now, this is important because God said, I give you power to get wealth. And so now the Bible said the gold is mine and the silver is mine, saith the Lord. So what does that mean? Gold and silver used to be what we uh, backed up our currency with. So it's the power that drives the economy. So it's the power behind the money. You see, a lot of people hold on to the money when the money is only representative of the power. Why hold on to a symbol of wealth when you can have the power to create wealth? You see, the moment you believe that money is going to make you rich is the moment you will be relegated to live in the realm of poverty. Because if money could have made you rich, you should have been rich a long time ago. You've been making money every week. You don't want the money. I mean, the money is good, but you want the power that drives the money. So listen to me carefully. If God, if God controls the power of the money or that drives the symbol of wealth, that means that if you have no money, you still have the, mo the power to create it. I, I don't work for money. You can't afford to pay me. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't afford me. No, no, say it like you mean it. You, you, you see, the moment you start chasing money, you become a slave to money. Money makes a good master a horrible, makes a good slave, excuse me, but a horrible master. Money makes a good slave, but a horrible master. The moment you uh, chase a dollar is the moment you give up your power to create wealth. When your silver and your gold multiplies, the thing that drives the gold and silver is mine. So one person's getting this. The power that makes a piece of paper of value. If government decides today that they're not going to use paper and cotton anymore and they're going to use buttons, that piece of paper 
that has that $100 on it is going to be worth nothing. Why? Because it's fiat. It is not real. Somebody bring me a dollar. Just run up here and bring me a dollar. Just a dollar. I know you got a dollar. I just need a dollar. One dollar. I like her. She's like, I don't, I don't roll with dollars. <laughs> give, me, give me the dollar, though. I need the dollar. God bless you for giving. You're getting this. Woman of God, you're getting this. If nobody else in here gets it, you're getting this. And there's a grace that is coming upon you to create wealth. And God, step up here a minute. You, God has just broken you out of lack. He is placing upon you an anointing of an entrepreneur. You will never work for another dollar for as long as you live. Money will work for you, oh, but you will not work for money. God is placing favor upon you. You are going to have opportunities that are going to throw, be thrown, in, uh, thrown at you. You are not going to have to chase it. The opportunities are going to chase you down. This year, you're going to be promoted. Next year, you're going to be, a, I don't know if you own a business, but you're going to own, you're going to own a very, very lucrative business. And God is setting you up. There's a gentleman, and he's a looking for a woman of color. And you are that woman. And God is going to give you great favor, and he's going to give you secrets in order to navigate this new economic uh, economic terrain and you are going to act, uh, you're going to navigate it and you're not going to have to give up your christianity you were overlooked for a couple of positions and it hurt you deeply but god is lifting the burden because he was closing the door for this bigger door to open for you you are frustrated but your season of frustration is over God said, you got it, you got it, you got it. And he said, because you got it quickly, he's not only going to allow you to create wealth, but you're going to be a wealth distributor. You are going to build, I see real estate. I see real estate. I see a portfolio of, a re of real estate that you're buying as a result of business deals. I see one piece of property that you, you're getting for pennies on a dollar, and that's going to start your entire portfolio. God is going to give you houses. He's going to give you land. He's going to give you property. I see this young lady that is attached to you. I don't know who this young lady is. Um, uh, it, it, I don't know if it's your daughter. Do you have a daughter? You have spiritual daughters? You don't have a daughter of your own? Um, I see you with a daughter of your own. I see you with a baby. <laughs> and I see you with a, a very huge family. This could be natural and spiritual. It could be natural and spiritual. No, but I see you with a daughter of your own. I, I, I don't claim to know, uh, to know the details. But I see you with a daughter of your own. And I see you passing down uh, something very significant to her as an inheritance. And it, it, it's got a lot of zeros behind it. It's going to happen even as I prophesied. In Jesus' name. Can I get $100 from someone? This particular uh, bill says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So that term legal tender simply means that there's something backing it up. Thank you, sir. There's something backing it up. So for all intents, could you please come back, sir? Could you please come back? And can I get an administrator just to run and get me some tapes? Can you, can you, a, a piece of tape. Can you run up here and just stand beside me, sir? Can you turn around? This way. You know the mic. You're going to hold it to my mouth. 
So legally speaking, the Federal Reserve should have uh, gold and silver to back this up. Uh, it's fiat. It's worth absolutely nothing uh, with, without gold and silver. So technically speaking, I could just rip it up like this. <laughs> Why? Because this is not the power. This is not the power. It's what's in the Federal Reserve. Okay? Thank you very much. He's going he's gonna, to uh, take this back for you. <laughs> Go with him. And, and get a woman to tape it back, please. Because if a man tapes it back, it's going to look like Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, get, and we're going to give you back your dollar. Thank you. Give him a hand clap. Now, why did I do this? Who had this dollar? You can come back and get your dollar. Thank you very much. You got to stop working for paper money. You gotta stop it. You gotta stop thinking that the more of this that you accrue, the wealthier you get. You gotta stop it. My friends are multimillionaires, they're billionaires. One of them, whenever we go out to dinner, he never has money. He always wants to borrow money. And he's filthy rich. He says, why do I need money? I got wealth. Well, if you're taking me to dinner, you need money. You know, we <laughs> <laughs> need something paper, something soft, right? Because <laughs> you can speak in tongues all you want. When it comes to paying the bill, they want that soft stuff. But he's got it. He has it. Why? Because he has wealth. And guess what? He don't need money. So wherever he goes, he just says, uh, can you buy me dinner? And everybody buys him dinner. Why? Because they know that he's what? Wealthy. And they want to do what? Rub shoulders with him. Just in case he wants to what? Divest his wealth. Now, why am I saying this? When you've got God, and he owns everything. <laughs> you just need to rub shoulders with him and drop his name. And watch the money start coming as he shows you how to build wealth. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. He's going to show you how to build wealth. Your gold, your silver the power behind the dollar is going to increase for you. So even if your dollars are gone, you don't worry about any, anything. Why? You've got the same power that created the dollar in the first place. You are not re relying on anyone else to give you money. You're creating your own wealth. I'm a wealth creator. So I don't work for money. Why? Because I know that there's a power that's greater than a dollar. And that's what I live by. I live by kingdom principles of wealth. I live by the principles that govern kingdom economic biblical finances. I don't, I don't, I don't, look, I'm never, I'm never, I don't care what things cost. I don't have to count. If I go into a store, I just buy. Are you with me? You are going to get to the point where you walk in a store and you don't have to look at the tag. You're going to walk in and you're going to be able to say, I want this, I want that, I want the other. I'm going somewhere with this. Because once your need is met, you're able to be used by God to meet the need of the kingdom and the need of the church. A lot of times we have a struggle with offering times because people have to decide whether I'm going to keep the money in my pocket 
to pay my bills or whether I'm going to honor God to perpetuate the kingdom with the wealth that he has given me. I decree from now onward, when you come to church, your bills will be paid. And God is going to use you as a kingdom distributor of wealth. You're going to come to church and the church will have a budget. And the pastor will be able to get up and say, church, we have a budget of $2.3 billion. And two of you will be able to get up and say, we'll take care of it. You know I'm not playing with this. I decree that things are shifting for you mentally. That you are no longer concerned how you're going to make ends meet. I decree from the day onward, the ends are meeting. They're not only meeting, they're circling. You are going to have an eternal supply of wealth. And it's going to come and it's never going to stop. From today onward, only good comes to you. Nothing bad, nothing to upset you is going to come your way. The cycle of lack is over. And your cycle of abundance is here. Let me move on quickly. Then thy heart will be lifted up. He said your gold is going to be your gold is going to be multiplied. Your silver is going to be multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied. Everything that you've got is multiplied. You just live in abundance. If you're surrounded in abundance and everything is multiplied. The more you give, the more God gives to you. The more you extend your hand, the more a hand is extended to, to you. You will never be worried about not having. You'll be able to come to church. You'll be able to underwrite the budget. A preacher will be able to stand up and say, can I have 10 of you to give $1,000 and you will be insulted. You'll walk away and say, I can't believe they only asked for $1,000. Why are they insulting us like that? Nobody's saying amen. amen. You know why? Because I'm talking about money. And you think I'm setting you up to give $1,000. But I'm not setting you up. I don't have hidden agendas like that. I came to get you blessed. Because if you're blessed, you'll be a blessing to us. But I want you to think a different way. The Bible said, that don't forget that your heart be lifted up, that thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, where there was no water, where there was no water. Your days of living thirsty is over. I decree and declare that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord is going to lift up a standard against him. The Bible said, who brought forth water out of the rock of the flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy father knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do good at the latter end. In other words, what you are going through is, is, is predicated on what you are going to. The Bible said that thou said in thy heart, my power and my might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. In other words, God is releasing an anointing in this season. And the anointing is a wealth creating anointing. But your destiny is about to change. The day that you were born, hallelujah, both of us, all of us, were given two proverbial envelopes. On the front of one was written incredible pleasure, success, vibrant health, and prosperity. On the other was written incredible pain. 
pain and failure and disease and poverty. And when open, each contain the same blank page. We call these pages destiny. In other words, in the envelope that had incredible pleasure, that had success, that had vibrant health, that had prosperity. There was a blank piece of paper in that envelope, but also in the envelope that had incredible wealth and vibrant health and prosperity. In that envelope, there was a blank page. In other words, when it comes to destiny, you decide on a daily basis which category of pages you are going to write on and your decision is done on a day-by-day basis. That means the very moment you make a decision, the very moment you choose an option, your destiny is altered because your destiny is decision-oriented Your destiny is being experienced. Your destiny is being engineered. Your destiny is being altered. Every time you make a decision, failure to make a decision is a decision not to make a decision. You are deciding not to make a decision. So you're making a decision anyway. Your spirit knows the geography of your destiny. It knows the terrain you have to navigate to get you from where you are to where God has scheduled you to be. Those decisions have to be made on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis. Your soul alone has the map for your future. Another person cannot give you that map. God downloads the map into your heart. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 says he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also he has set the world in your heart so that no man can find out the work God make it from the beginning to the end. In other words destiny shows up as an inner prompting. It shows up up as the wooing of the Holy Spirit. It shows up as a still small voice. That means you can trust this indirect spiritual side of yourself. It's where God hides your dream. It's where God hides your vision. It's where God hides your purpose. It's where God reveals your assignment. The Holy Spirit is given to you because it is his job to upload what God downloaded the day that you were conceived. God was able to say to David, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God said to Joshua, before you were conceived in your mother's womb I knew you hallelujah I ordain that you are a prophet to many nations how does God do it 1 Corinthians 2 9 to 16 says but I have not seen ear hath not heard neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Is there anybody here today that will raise their hands and say I love the Lord. There are some things that God has prepared for you that most people will never discern. You've got to be able to hallelujah stay with the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit reveals to you the things that God has prepared for you. The Bible says
this. God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. The most important personality in this dispensation of grace is the Holy Spirit. Get to know the Holy Spirit. This is the one discipline. The enemy will fight you. He would rather you listen to what they're saying on Facebook, to what they're repeating on CNN, for what they're Skyping, for what they're tweeting, than to hear the Spirit of God. If you are hearing what the Spirit is saying, you will understand that he is the third person of the Holy Trinity. He is a prophetic spirit. Even if you come to a prophetic meeting and the prophet doesn't prophesy to you, you haven't lost anything. A prophet can only prophesy in part. They can only know in part. But the Holy Spirit is the one that searches all things not just a portion of it he searches all things if you want to know what God has in store for you in your future begin to talk to God and God through the Holy Spirit will talk back to you the Bible indicates that his conversation will not be shallow I'm sick and tired uh, of shallow Christians. Uh, no depth in them. Uh, but the Bible says uh, a person who has a relationship uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, will not engage uh, in shallow conversations. Uh, why? Because it is he uh, that searches the deep things of God. Uh, I decree and declare uh, your days of living shallow are over. Your days of speaking shallow are over. I decree and declare a new anointing is being released upon you. It's an anointing for deep things. When people see you, they're not going to talk about how carnal you are. They're going to talk about how deep you are. I decree and declare you are no longer satisfied with shallow Christianity. Tonight, the Holy Ghost is inviting you to launch out into the deep I decree and declare a relaunching of your life a relaunching of your ministry a relaunching of your business I decree you are going out in the deep the fish are jumping in the deep I decree you are no longer building sand castles. Uh, you are going for it. Uh, you have a date with destiny. Uh, you are not going to pay it safe. Uh, you are not going to uh, be satisfied uh, with living amongst uh, the clutter of the common. Uh, I decree uh, you are going for the uncommon. Uh, uncommon favor. Uh, uncommon wealth. Uh, and uncommon anointing. Uh, I decree you are launching out. I decree 2017, a year of launching. I decree your business is going to be launched. Your ministry is going to be launched. Your projects are going to be launched. New businesses are coming out of this place. You are going to launch new products. You are going to launch new songs. God is going to give you the ability to ride some new waves. I decree. Uh, 
you are launching out into the deep. The Bible says, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have not received, hallelujah, the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given given unto us brothers and sisters God wants to give you something do you have the capacity to believe that your life is about to change you don't have to wait for it any longer the Bible said the secret things belong unto God but those things which are revealed Revealed uh, belong unto man. Uh, I decree and declare the eyes of your understanding uh, is being enlightened uh, this is a season of revelation uh, the Holy Ghost uh, is comparing spiritual things uh, with spirits uh, your natural man uh, may not receive it uh, but your spiritual man uh, is strong enough to receive it uh, I decree uh, an enlargement of your spirit Spirit, I decree the anointing of Jabez is falling in this place. Enlarge my territory. Oh, that thou would bless me indeed. Nobody around Jabez expected anything from him. It means that he lived with lids and he lived with limitations. But this is a season you are going to live without lids. You are going to live without limitation. You have a date with destiny. Your date is not determined by a man. God determined your destiny in our text. A young woman by the name of Ruth, she was blessed to marry a Jew, but she herself was a mere Gentile. Nobody expected the Moabites to do anything other than to worship their idols and to live in perversion. But God sent a woman by the name of Naomi brothers and sisters ladies and gentlemen when God announces he's getting ready to change your destiny he introduces a new person and a new relationship into your life I decree and declare you will not drive them out but when the wrong people leave your life, wrong things stop happening and it leaves room for the right people to come in your life. If you want to know what your destiny is going to be, examine the life of the five people around you and you will be the sick. If the five people around you uh, are poor, uh, you are going to be the six. Uh, if the five people around you uh, are covetous, uh, you are going to be the six. Uh, if the five people around you uh, are carnal, uh, you're going to be the six. Uh, but if the five people around you uh, are spiritual, uh, you're going to be spiritual. Uh, if the five people around you uh, are 
idiots. You're going to be the six. If the five people around you are beggars, you're going to be the six. But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, if the five people around you are anointed, you're going to be anointed. If the five people around you are prayers, you are going to be the six. If the five people around you are millionaires, you're going to be the six. Turn to your neighbor and tell them it's time for you to shift. If the people around you don't want to leave, they know what you're carrying. They know what you have. If they don't want to leave, give yourself a going away party in our tax. Naomi and her daughters-in-law, hallelujah, sons, hallelujah, lost their husband. And they had to decide what they were going to do. Naomi made the decision that I'm going back to Bethlehem and her two daughters-in-law say we're going with you but when the pressure was put on him, their daughters-in-law hallelujah one hallelujah decided that I'm going back but the other made a decision I know what's back there I don't want to repeat an old season I'm going to take a leap of faith. I decree and declare this is the season. You're going to take a leap of faith. You're going to stop talking about starting a business. Take the leap. You're going to stop talking about leaving. You're going to leave. You're going to stop talking about buying your own home. You're going to buy it. You're going to stop talking about what you're going to buy. How you're going to buy it. I decree and declare you're taking the leap of faith. Ruth decided I know what my past looks like but I'm making a decision to move forward I decree and declare your days of being stuck are over it's time for you to move forward not only will you move forward but you're going to move on I discovered that just because a person moves forward doesn't mean that they moved on don't be like Lot wife turning into a pillar of salt she could not walk away from what was she spent the rest of her days wishing things could be the same but God had to burn down Sodom and Gomorrah why did he burn it down to make certain that they had nothing to go back to. I decree and declare your prophetic Sodom and Gomorrah is going up in smoke. You've been through some things. You lost some things. And when you look back, the devil wants you to be in a state of grief. But God allowed it to happen to make sure you had nothing to go back to. You had nothing to go back to. Why would you want to repeat your past when God has a brighter future? Why hang on to the bitterness of your past when God has a better future? You have a date with destiny destiny flows from the dimension of thoughts which manifests itself as an intention an intention to action Oprah was wishy-washy I 
decree your days of wishy-washy are over you're gonna make a decision you're gonna stick to it this is what Ruth says no matter what your God shall be my God whatever you are that's what I'm gonna build my new life with brothers sisters ladies gentlemen there's something uh, I've learned from this text uh, I've learned uh, that I am enough uh, to succeed you are enough it's not about uh, what you have it's about uh, who you are uh, the Bible said uh, the Lord uh, is going to bless you uh, a thousand times more even as you are even if you don't have any money who are you I'll tell you who I am I am the head and not the tail I am first and not last I am more than enough Jesus on the inside Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You have a date with destiny. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, and it shall come to pass. No ifs, no mites, but it shall. An irrefutable promise. If you're hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do the commandments which I command you this day that the Lord thy God will set you on high. I decree and declare your destiny is to have the competitive advantage. You have no competition. God is setting you up. That means your setback was a setup for future success. It's all downhill from this point. The Bible says and these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you hearken unto the voice of God. I decree you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit as he whispers in your ears your response is yes Lord you're not going to worry how you're going to pay for it you're not going to worry how you're going to build it you're not going to reduce the vision that God is giving you to fix your pocketbook but you're going to believe until your pocketbook expands to accommodate your vision these blessings shall overtake you blessed shall you be in the city God is going to bless you in the city your destiny is to succeed in the city he said you're going to be blessed in the field wherever you go your destiny is to be blessed you're going to be blessed if you live in the city you're going to be blessed if you live in the country the blessing shall be in the field blessed shall be the fruits of your body the fruit of your body is your children your children are destined to go to the best schools your children are destined to go to the best university it's their destiny 
blessed for the bee, the fruit of the ground. God decreed your destiny is to own gold mines, diamond mines, oil mines, fossil fuel, precious metal. He said you're blessed in the fruit of your cattle, your meats, your animal skin. No more pleather. You're going to wear leather. Your shoes are going to be leather. Your bags are going to be leather. No more knockoffs. You're going to wear the real deal. The increase of your kind. Your kind was the animals they use for transportation today we don't ride on donkeys we don't ride on horses we ride horse powered car I decree Lamborghinis I decree Mercedes Benz I decree Maserati I decree Jaguars I decree it, you'll ride the best of cars. You'll not only ride in first class on the airplane, you'll own your own airplane. It is your destiny. The Bible said your flocks and sheep are going to increase. This is your wealth. It is your destiny to be wealthy. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Your basket is your checking account. Your store is your saving account. I decree this is the lowest your checking account will ever be this is the lowest your saving account will ever be I prophesy it I decree it I declare it it is your destiny to have abundance in your checking account your account will never say overdrawn I decree no less than six figures seven figures eight figures nine figures ten figures it is your destiny if you believe it shout it's my destiny blessed shalt thou be when thou cometh in shout it's my destiny that means when you uh, come in from work, uh, you don't have a headache. Uh, you're coming in stress-free. Uh, the work is not stressing you out. Uh, you don't work for money, uh, but money works for you. Uh, glory to God. Uh, you are blessed uh, when thou go out. Uh, when you go out to work, uh, you're going out happy. Uh, but when you come in from from work and you go to sleep the problems of the day is going to scurry in the night and when you wake up in the morning the problems will disappear you are blessed the Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face they shall come out against thee one way they shall flee before these seven different ways God is going to give you victory in all your spiritual warfare one of the things Albert Einstein said great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre mind the mediocre mind is incapable of understanding the man who refuses to bow blindly to conventional prejudices and chooses instead to express his opinion courageously your enemies that scorn you today are going to respect you tomorrow 
your enemies that overlooked you today are going to look up to you tomorrow. It is your destiny. The Lord shall command his blessings on your storehouse. That's your investments. That's your stocks. That's your bonds. That's your mutual fund. That's your 401k. It is your destiny to have an impressive investment portfolio. The Bible says he's going to command his blessing and all thy set at thy hands to do. It means you're going to be blessed to be an entrepreneur and a businessman and a businesswoman. It is your destiny. The Bible says he will bless the land which God gave thee. You are not only going to have an impressive investment portfolio. You are going to have a real estate portfolio. Get ready to live in a mansion-free mortgage or a mortgage-free mansion. Get ready to have mortgage-free guest houses, vacation home. It is your destiny. It is your destiny. The Bible said he's going to establish you, a holy people. The Bible said that all that see you are going to be afraid of you. Your spiritual maturation is going to give you influence affluence notoriety and respect it is your destiny it is your destiny to have scandalous wealth it is your destiny to be an innovator it is your destiny the bible says that you're going to land to many nations and you shall not borrow. It is your destiny to own a bank. There's a bank only here. You are here today. The Lord says verse number 13 and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. What does that mean? It is your destiny to be CEO, CFO, president, owner, prime minister, governor, mayor, city council, brothers, sisters, ladies, gentlemen, you have a date with destiny. Little did Ruth know that a decision was altering her destiny. The moment she decided to embrace the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is able to change your name, the God who is able to change your destiny. The God who is able to change your nature. He is the God that has given you a great destiny. You may not see how God is going to do it. But on a day by day basis. Consult with the Lord. God. I have these options. What do I take? Do I take the right? Do I take the left? Do I go for it? Or do I take a few steps back? If you understand that destiny is determined by a decision, you could have made the decision to stay home. And staying home would have been your destiny tonight. But you decided to hang out with us. And hanging out with us 
is your destiny. Your destiny is not determined by demons or deacons. Your destiny is determined by you. Your soul knows the terrain of your destiny. God has given you the Holy Ghost. How do I know? Your destiny will not come with screaming and in a loud voice. But when God speaks to you, it's in a still small voice. Destiny whispers. If you're a preacher, it whispers preach. If you're a dancer, it whisper dance. If you are a singer, it whisper songs. If you were Michael Jackson, it'll whisper, beat it. If you were Michael Jordan, it will whisper, dunk. If you were Michael Angelo, it will whisper, paint. If you were Maya Angelo, it will whisper, write. If you were Steven Jobs, it will whisper, iPhone iPad, it will whisper your options. Destiny is not purpose. Purpose is why you were born. Destiny is where you're going, where you end up. Tomorrow is based on the decisions you made, the prodigal son altered his destiny he said father give me my inheritance he left his father's house he ended up in a pig pen but the bible said when he came to himself he made a decision i don't belong here the scripture said nobody gave to him if you're waiting for someone to change your destiny. You wait until the rapture tonight. You got to say, I deserve better than this. I will arise. Get up, get up, get up. Get in a hurry. Destiny is calling is pushing you have a date with destiny in conclusion in conclusion purpose is determined by god and you have to discover it but destiny is determined by you. You choose your path. But God would order your steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. When we talk about destiny, we usually talk about something that most people have never defined for us. All of us have options in life. And every single day, you get to choose where you end up at the end of the day. Oprah makes millions of dollars. Why? Because she decided to be the best talk show host. Nobody gave it to her because she didn't look the part. She was in blonde hair, blue eye. She was a black woman. And she took a step back and say, I'm black. I'm curvaceous. They're not going to like me. I'm just going to wait. Her time and her season would have came and went. And it would have been too late. But when she came to a fork in the road, she made a series of decisions. 
God will not only speak to you about your destiny. He'll give you a strategy to go along with it. Noah was given an art building strategy. To change the destiny of humanity. Joseph was given an economic strategy. Moses was given a legal strategy. Esther was given a strategy that saved her entire nation from ethnic cleansing. Strategy is attached to an outcome. If you don't know what your purpose is, your destiny will not look like anything that God has determined for you. Every single day you awaken and every decision you are making is altering your destiny. When we talk about destiny, it's not just blanket. You have a spiritual destiny. You have a financial destiny. You have a relational destiny. You have a social destiny. You have a political destiny. You have a professional destiny, a personal destiny. You have a domestic destiny. You have a cultural destiny. It's not just one destiny. And every day you've got to wake up. And you've got to shift your thoughts into gear. You've got to take your life out of neutral. Because if you don't make a series of destiny decisions, someone else will make it for you. The prodigal son hooked up with the citizens and they sent it into the pig pen. He lost his personal power. Tonight, I decree and declare you're getting your personal power back. People, the government, culture will no longer determine where you end up tomorrow. Your boss will not determine it. Tonight, God places destiny decisions before you. Here is Ruth, the product of an ancestral relationship. She's in a culture of idolatry where everybody is worshiping God. And God introduces one person into our life. Listen to me carefully. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. And when that person appears, you have to have open eyes to see what they're carrying. You see, when God sent me here, this is not a game for me. This is this great woman of God's ministry. This is not a game. Your life is not a game. I don't play games. That's not what I do. I'm not your girl that plays games. I'm the truth girl. I came here to challenge you. To challenge you to think for a change. Your thoughts determine where you live, where you work, what you drive. Your thoughts, not my thoughts, not the government's thoughts, not the, your boss's thoughts, your thoughts thoughts and if I were to examine your life the last thing I would do would be blaming the devil for where you are I would put the responsibility back into your lap and say you are 100% responsible listen to me here's me there should be no male no man that is associated with this woman that ever walks up to her and asks her for a dollar. It's ridiculous that if you have any male in this ministry or associated with this woman of God and she's a widower that walks up and asks her for a dollar you should be giving to her not taking from her she's a woman and you should be embarrassed you should be embarrassed to ask any woman for anything. It should be an embarrassment. Someone strip you of your manhood, but I'm your girl because I believe in my kings. I believe, I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. What's wrong with our black male, the black female? Because you rise to the expectation. We let you get away. 
The single woman has to take care of those babies. And the male gets to tap out by saying, I don't have a job. Well, how do you think that woman that you made that baby, you had the pleasure to make the baby with, how do you think that woman feeds your baby? She doesn't have an option to tap out. She has to go out. She has to keep a roof over. And you get to do what? Tell me you don't have a job. expectations your decisions are made based on expectations an expectation is a lid when people don't expect anything more from you there's a lid that's placed over you and the only thing that Blake breaks the lid is your expectations for yourself what do you expect what do you expect your life to look like a year from now two years from now Expectation is the mother of miracles. If you expect nobody to help you, nobody's going to help you. If you expect to be unemployed, you're going to be unemployed. That's the lid. Jabez says, nobody in my community. My mother said, I cause pain. That's what Jabez means. Wherever you go, you're going to be a pain. In other words, you're a pain in the butt. Imagine growing up and your mother calling you a pain in the butt. Nobody expected more from Jabez. But the Holy Spirit whispered destiny. And he broke through man's. He said, oh, that thou would bless me indeed. That you would enlarge my territory. You cannot be enlarged out here if you're not enlarged here. Show me your wallet, I'll show you your thoughts. Show me your relationships, I'll show you your thoughts. Show me where you live. I'll show you your thoughts. Show me what you drive. I'll show you your thoughts. Show me your paycheck. And I'll show you your thoughts. You don't get to tap out. You get to make the decision. Your destiny is determined by your decision. Look at your life. And as an adult and a believer, you can't keep blaming the devil. If your life is successful, God anointed you to be successful and you accessed it. But if your life is not, he still anointed you, but you made a decision not to access it. So where you end up is not the devil. It's you listening to the prompting of the spirit. And then you make a decision. And I'm going for it fully. If you don't like where you are financially, emotionally, spiritually, stop blaming it on the choir and the praise team. You got a Bible. You got music. Do your own worship. You can do better. Nobody's coming after you. They're going to only help you for a short while. You're going to get up from where you are. You're going to determine, where do I want to be? And you ask the Holy Spirit, what did you have in mind for me? I walked away from success. I was very successful. But I walked into greater success. And all my friends, they were comfortable. But now they're all retired and they're only getting a portion of their paycheck. And I'm still creating wealth. There's no lid or limit to how far I can go. Why? Because my expectations are from God. I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Elijah was running from Jezebel. He ended up in a cave. You remember that story? He was so depressed. Angels was feeding him. But that wasn't enough. He just wanted to die. So he goes into this cave. And this hurricane breaks out. A violent wind. God wasn't in the noise. 
Then there was a firestorm. And God wasn't in the firestorm. But then there was a still, small voice. He said, get out. And he had to make a decision because he still had something great to do. He was a kingmaker. He goes out and he anoints two kings and a prophet. You have so much life ahead of you. Destiny is not going to scream at you. It's not like a megaphone. It's that still small voice of the spirit. He goes and he searches the deep things that God loaded into your DNA. And he uploads it. And oftentimes when you make decisions, you're out of step with your family and friends. When I left politics, I, I ran my country. I was extremely influential. Everybody said, you've got to be crazy. What you've got, people are fighting for that. That was given to you on a silver platter and you're walking away. But I couldn't explain to anybody because destiny doesn't confer with anybody. You can't sit and ask a person, what do you think about this decision? Because it didn't come from them. It comes from God. When you mature in the things of the Lord, you know how to walk away from good into best. And when you get to best, God is still not finished with you. Because then he whispers to you, I don't want you to do your best. Because you place limits. When you do your best, guess what happens? That's as far as you can go. He whispers, I want you to do better tomorrow than what you did yesterday. If you do better and better and better, at the end of your life, you will maximize your potential. Destiny whispers. You're often out of sync with man but in sync with God. And when you make destiny decisions, you will temporarily inconvenience everybody. Only for them to be permanently blessed. Do you have the courage? Destiny is calling. You might as well answer. That confusion that you're feeling it's because you've got to make a destiny decision. But you're afraid of the fallout. You're afraid of, afraid of being misunderstood, misjudged, and talked about. But God is not giving you the spirit of fear, but power of love, a sound mind. I've closed my laptop, and I'm going to close my message. I'm not finished, but I'm going to stop. You know, I have a lot to say. I wish I could just teach you about destiny and purpose. But the last thing I want to say is this. The next move is yours. God is speaking to you, has spoken to you, has told, him, told you what to do. Dr. Trim, how do I get rid of confusion, make a decision, and leave the outcome to God. Leave the outcome. You don't determine the outcome. Leave the outcome to God. It's all going to work together for good. If he tells you to walk away, give up. If he tells you to give, just do it. I was teaching on uh, giving. I was telling the congregation about seed an apostle when I got there the people had been so battered and bruised when it came to giving and so the Holy Spirit said to me they don't believe you you see a thousand dollar seed changed my financial destiny it altered it my salary could not break poverty from off of me 
what broke the poverty was my revelation of the season. One man of God just stood there and threw out a challenge to everybody that was in the congregation. Called the number. Three came up. And he waited 45 minutes for me to get the revelation. It was after a service. The musician was playing like that. He said, there's one more. I can't leave until that one. I was looking at my pocket. I was unemployed. Didn't have a job, didn't have money. I was fresh into full-time ministry. Didn't have engagements. Didn't own my home. Didn't have a car. And he called for a $1,000 seed. I had leased a house. I had just over $1,000 in the bank, enough for the next month's rent. So I knew he wasn't talking to me. He said he had llamas and camels and goats and ducks and he never had to work a day in his life. I had to figure out how I was going to eat that night. And he waited for me. That day that I decided that God is speaking to me, nobody else knew. The three came up. But everybody was in the same financial state that I was. We were robbing Peter to pay Paul, and then Peter dies. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And the Holy Spirit uploaded my destiny right there. And he began to talk to me. He said, Cindy, this is what I want you to do. I want you to give. And he gave me the revelation. He was standing on the stage. He said, when you give at that level, you're not giving to the man, you're giving to the realm he's living in. You don't need to drop names. He don't need to know you. You don't need to know him. Get to know me. Because I'm the one that gives you power to get wealth. After 45 minutes, I came up. I gave the money. I actually had to leave church. Get the money out of the bank. Drive back. Gave the $1,000 seed. And I had buyer's remorse. When I went in my car, the devil said, you're crazy. He told you he don't need money. He's a multimillionaire. All preachers want his money. And I had to rebuke the devil that day. Destiny is about revelation. It's not just a blanket destiny. Financial destiny. Health destiny. Relational destiny. Social. Spiritual. Ministerial. They all take decisions. You have to make decisions in all these areas. And you've got to do it every day. And God will give you options. You've got you to live your life in gear. Can be neutral. When I left, the first year went by, no harvest. The second year went by, no harvest. God gave me a million dollar idea. When you give in order to change your destiny, I'm not talking about tithes and offerings. That's what your pastor takes. What I receive is seed. You gave your offering. You got to get the revelation of a seed. Don't ever think that it's the same thing as the regular offering. Don't ever think that it's the same thing as your tithe. It is not. It does something different in the realm of the spirit. When you give seeds, your mind is a soil. What God will do, he would drop another seed as an idea. And you've got to cultivate that idea. You're, a lot of you keep missing your destiny because you keep looking for money. Money doesn't rule the world. Thoughts and ideas do. If you can just get an idea. God gave me the idea. It was a multi-million dollar idea. I'm still living from the residual effect. And that was 15 years ago that he gave me, he made that demand. That one idea that God gave me 15 years ago is still paying my bills. I'm still living off of the residual. You see, I know where you are. I know what you're going through because I said where you are. I said gift, gifted just like you with dreams just like you. I said right where you sat with destiny, with purpose. And nobody came for me. The Holy Spirit began to upload what, the, what God had downloaded. And it's downloaded in your DNA. 
I had to believe one step at a time. From the day I gave that $1,000 and God gave me the idea, I've had multiple million-dollar ideas that are still paying the bills. I have staff all around the world. I have staff in Canada, England, Bermuda, uh, Sri Lanka, Colorado, Atlanta, Maryland. I run a business, not just a ministry. A multi-million dollar business was an idea that God gave me. Listen to me carefully. Don't underestimate the power of God in your life. Don't turn him into a religious God. He came that he might give you life. He wants to give you life strategies to alter your destiny in every area. From the time I planted my first $1,000 seed to the time I got my first harvest was four years. In the third year, all hell broke loose. And I stood to lose everything. That's when I wrote the book, The Rules of Engagement. And my life has been different ever since. This man of God was a best-selling author. I'm a best-selling author. He's a millionaire, I'm a millionaire. He owns houses, I own houses. Why? Because I gave into a realm and it changed my destiny. A lot of people you're giving to are not legitimate orphans and widowers. The Bible said take care of the widows and the widowers and take care of the orphans. A lot of you, your financial destiny is stuck because you keep giving into the realm of beggars and lazy people. And so what happens? That's your destiny. Your Uncle Bubba, he's been begging your family all his life. He's still begging. You got to change the direction of your giving and the flow of your living will change. When you have people around you, don't look at them from their gender. As long as you see me as Cindy, you will never be able to benefit from me. From me. See me as Dr. Trim, the minister of God. Don't look at my gender. See what I'm carrying. I ran a country, not, 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 not a church, a country. I retired at 32. I've been saved since 17. And I never compromised my Christian values to climb the ladder. I didn't have to sleep my way to the top. I didn't have to sell my soul to get anything. I'm a Christian. And I'm a Christian woman. And I don't compromise my Christian standards for anybody. I cannot be bought and I cannot be bossed.